four. As you look there, um, that on next Saturday at Western State College, they're going to have a summit, a men to men summit. Uh, they had one on last year. It was a very, very uh, exciting event. And uh, Sister Lisa Harris Mosley is working on that. She and Sister Frances Alexander Brooks. And so if you're interested in trying to be involved in trying to help young men uh, make their passage from uh, adolescence in their teen years to manhood, I'd encourage you to uh, block out time to attend that. Uh, there's also going to be, been on, be a event on Friday evening, uh, May the 12th, uh, down at the West Virginia State uh, University. And what building is it in, Lisa? In the Fine Arts Building. And so they're going to have a keynote speaker on Friday evening, a young man that some of you might be familiar with. He used to be on BET and then also another keynote speaker at lunch on a Saturday. So uh, more information, you can call the church and get more information about that. And then I want also in the school on May the 23rd, you know, Chandler Elementary School's over on Chandler Drive, right below Orchard Manor. And uh, it's a school that uh, we have some youth that attend that school. It's where our own dear sister Christy Wesley is a teacher. And every year they have an annual Read to Me Day to where they try to mobilize volunteers from the community to come over and spend uh, some time in the afternoon reading uh, to the children there. So Mrs. Day is gonna kind of keep a sign up sheet if you think you might be interested. We would like to have a delegation from our church. I think each year we've had individuals that have participated. And so we would encourage you to consider doing that. It's about a couple hours in the afternoon, as I recall, maybe about one to three. Uh, and I'm sure they would appreciate it over at Chandler Elementary School. Then also, if the Lord is willing, uh, on next Sunday, which is uh, Mother's Day. Uh, we're gonna have a special Mother's Day service, so we'd encourage you to invite friends and family to come, and our youth will be ministering in music, and also our liturgical dance team will be ministering uh, in dance. We have some other things that are somewhat a top secret, and so you don't wanna miss it. Um, unfortunately, we can't, not, we can't replicate uh, those services in both services, so that special activity will take place in the second service. And so we'd certainly appreciate you coming out and being a part of that. Well, we got a lot of business to take care of this morning. So if you would uh, invite you to turn in your Bible to the fifth chapter of the book of James, James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And we're going to be continuing this morning uh, our series that we began on last week as we move from the series dealing with the church uh, to a series dealing with prayer. And we're concluding a series on what in the world is the church. And we're concluding that series with this idea that the church, the church is the people that pray for one another. The people that pray for one another. And so this morning, I want to just to uh, drop a few nuggets uh, upon you to see if the Lord might will encourage your heart to make even a greater ministry, which, a greater commitment which you've already made to this whole ministry of, of prayer. We could stand together in honor of the public reading of God's word. And I want to read just a few verses from James chapter 5, but I want to pick up the reading with verse 13. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any among you cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruits. May the Lord preach his blessing be to the reading of his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, for the entrance of your word indeed gives light. It illumines our hearts and our minds, it elevates our spirits, and we are greatly encouraged to look unto Jesus. Now speak to us one more time that we might see Jesus in all of his majesty, his splendor, and his glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated. 
the Bible is replete with this great grand theme that prayer is to be an essential part of the Christian's lives. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself modeled this whole idea of an effective prayer ministry. So much so that his disciples, after hearing him pray, they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. There was something about the prayer life of Jesus that stirred his disciples to want to emulate him and to imitate him in prayer. There's nowhere in the gospel records where they said, Lord, teach us to teach the way you teach or teach us to preach the way you preached. But they did say, Lord, teach us to pray. And there was something that was simply revolutionary, something that was altogether new because Jesus talked to God like he was his father. And he talked to God like he expected God to hear and to listen. And so in response to that request that they might be instructed how to pray, Jesus told his disciples what we affectionately refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And it's okay to call it that, but technically that's incorrect. It really should be called the Disciples' Prayer. That's the way he taught them to pray. Now, the Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer. But the disciple prayer, disciples' prayer, as recorded in Matthew chapter 6, was to serve as a model as to how they were to pray. He did not give them as a, that as a prayer to be just repeated by rote memory and just to recite it on every occasion. But the disciples' prayer was to serve as a skeleton outline or model as to how they were to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And in coming weeks, we will look at each aspect of that prayer, and we will see that it could serve as a model, a skeletal outline as we talk to our Father about his kingdom, and about his rule, and about our need for daily sustenance, and about our need for daily direction and guidance, and about our need to, to be daily impressed upon that we need to learn how to forgive. If you work your way through that prayer, you will see that Jesus touches on both the heavenly and the earthly in terms of what we need to do to advance his kingdom and his rule. And so prayer is a theme that's replete throughout the Bible. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells the prayer of the widow woman who had had misjustice passed against her. And he said with great determination, she continued to approach the judge until he came back, reconvened the court, and he discharged justice. And Jesus, in a striking comparison or contrast, if an unjust judge can be moved to righteousness, how much more will a holy God respond to the plea and to the cries of his people? The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he admonishes the church at Thessalonica and to us that we should pray without ceasing. Paul instructed Timothy that he would that men would pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, pray for kings and for those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And Jesus underscores it. He says, men would always pray in Luke 18 and not faint. So if we're going to continue to run and not get weary and persevere, in the face of opposition, we must have effective, effective prayer lives. Last week, as we talked about this theme of prayer, and we looked at some of the components of prayer as in terms of what does prayer really mean? And we talk about prayer is nothing more than a conversation with God. Intercessory prayer is nothing more than a conversation with God on behalf of someone else, when we intercede on behalf of someone else. And then we also talked about prayer being a sign of our dependency. We talked about prayer being a sign of our humility, of our brokenness before God, and a recognition that we needed God in a most desperate way. Prayer is a sign of faith that we believe that God is, and so we're not just praying into space, but we're praying in faith and believing that God is, and that prayer is a sign that we have hope. That there's a God who hears prayer, and there's a God who answers prayer, and there's a God who responds to our prayer. And so we select this text in Matthew chapter, or James chapter 5, because as James comes to the conclusion of this epistle to these persecuted Christians who have been dispersed abroad as a result of the persecution against them. 
And James closes his little epistle of encouragement with this admonition that they should pray. The first thing I want you to see here is the exhortation to pray. James 5, 13, if any among you suffering, let him pray. The King James says, if there are any that are afflicted among you, let him pray. That word for afflicted or suffering is a very interesting word in the Greek text. It is a compound word, and the, the prefix of that word means uh, evil, and the, and, the, and the root of the word means suffering, uh, kapatheos, evil suffering. And so what it carries, to be afflicted, it carries the idea that you are suffering as the result of evil, or the suffering as a result of evil that's imposed upon you by others, to suffer as the result of evil. Paul used the same word when he says endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So it carries the idea of being afflicted and being suffering and suffering as the result of evil that exists in the world. So James' exhortation is, is there any among you that are afflicted, any among you that are suffering, James says, let him or let her pray. And then he goes on to say in James 5, 13, B, if any among you cheerful or if anyone is cheerful, let him sing psalms. So the exhortation to the afflicted and to the suffering is to pray. The exhortation to the cheerful is to pray. Now, there's an interesting word there again that James uses for cheerful. I think the King James says, any among you are merry. And this is a fascinating word that he uses here. It carries the idea of things being well with the soul. And so James says, if things are well with your soul, then you ought to sing psalms. You know, we used to sing the church, that song, we got to get back to the church, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. And so James says, if it's well with your soul, then you ought to sing psalms. If it's well with your soul, then you ought to praise. You ought to praise God. And if we were to survey, as we talked about last week, the church, two of the weakest areas of our Christian stewardship is our prayer life and our praise life. Uh, when things, when we ought to pray, we aren't praying, we're complaining to folk. And we ought to be praising God then we seem just to be caught up in the euphoria of the moment rather than stopping and pausing to praise God for his goodness. So James says, to the afflicted, you are to pray. To the cheerful or to the merry, you are to praise God. When things are well with your soul, you are to praise God. Then he goes on to say there in that text in James 5, 13, let him sing psalms. Now that's also an interesting play on words by James. Because the word that he uses there for the singing of psalms, it, it carried the idea of the playing of a string instrument. You know, Paul used that same phraseology when he says, be not drunk with wine, whereas in excess will be filled with the Spirit in, James, in Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so what James says is that when things are well with your soul, Without musical accompaniment, you ought to be able to tickle the strings of your heart. And the heart strings being tickled should cause you to birth forth with praise to the Lord because it is well with your soul. And you have a cheerful soul. You have a merry soul. And James says we're, we're tickling the chord strings of our hearts and we're making melody to the Lord and we're singing praises to God, then the overflow of our praise can be a blessing to somebody else. The overflow of our praise from our heart, sometimes we can strike up a song and someone who's tired and weary and frustrated and angry, but when they hear us singing a song, it can bring spiritual refreshment to their soul and they will sing in the chorus and all of a sudden they are lifted. The spirit is lifted above the situation or the circumstance. So James says we should not harbor or we should not hold on to the merriment of our soul to ourselves. We are to sing praises to God that that overflow of our praise might be a blessing to others. If you're afflicted, James says, you are to pray. If you're merry or you're cheerful, James says, you are to praise. 
This is an exhortation to us. But watch what else James says. And this may be one of the most misunderstood and misinterpreted passages of, of the Scripture of the New Testament. He says, is any among you sick, verse 14, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will forgive or be forgiven. Now, let me do a little spade work. This is important that we look at some things here. If you were to get a Vines Expository Dictionary of the New Testament, and if you were to go into Vines Expository Dictionary of the New Testament, if you were to look up the word sick in this particular book, you'd find an interesting word. Matter of fact, you'd find several words that Dr. Vines lists that's used in the Greek text to define sickness. Now, the problem with the translation from the Greek text to the English text is that the Greek text has more vivid ways of describing things, so it has many different words to give shades of different meanings. And very often in the translation, we struggle because we don't have as many words as they have to describe some of the same type things. And we've talked about that before. This was the simple word, love. It's often translated in the New Testament love where the Greeks had three, even four words that's used to describe love, whether it's talking about brotherly love, uh, phileo, God type of love, agape, or erotic sexual love. Uh, so it, there's ways of, of bringing about shades of meaning that we struggle with in the English text. Now, there's nothing about our salvation we got to worry about because that's pretty clear. But there are some things that can only be interpreted by looking at the Greek text to see what exactly was the author trying to say. This is one such text. The first word that is used there in James chapter 5, verse 15, of James 5, 14, which is, any among you sick? Now, the word that James uses as he's led by the Holy Spirit is astheneo. A-S-T-H-E-N-E-O is the Greek transliteration from the Greek to the English text. Astaneo. And the word astaneo is often used to describe someone is weak, someone is feeble. They're weak and they're feeble, and they are weak and they're feeble because they are diseased. It's the most common word that's used in the gospel that refers to impotent folk, diseased folk. And so these people are weak and they're feeble because they are diseased. They have some physical illness, some physical malady. But sometimes it's used to only describe someone that is weak and feeble, but it may not refer to them being weak and feeble because they are diseased. Are you following me? It has a dual meaning. Someone can be weak and feeble because they are diseased, or they can be weak and feeble because of another situation or scenario. But what James does that's really good for us is that he uses two of the words in the same section, I think, to help us to understand and to interpret what he was communicating. If you go on down there, in verse 15, he says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And very often the Bible will interpret itself in a very, very short paragraph. He uses ostaneo in verse 14, but in verse 15 he used kamno, K-A-M-N-O. And kamno refers to someone that is weary and tired because of work. They're weary and they're tired. They're exhausted simply because of work. It is the consequence of, of being overworked. It's the same word that Paul used in Galatians when he says, be not weary in your well-doing. You're getting weary, come no, in well-doing because well-doing will wear you out. So he says, there are sometimes people are weary and they are tired and they are exhausted because they are overworked. And that weariness first starts in the mind. There's a weariness that takes place in our mind when we're overworked and when, when we're overstressed. And so now we become weary in our mind and then we suffer from sleep deprivation because we've worked too much and slept too little. Now the weariness is moved from our mind to our bodies. Now, in weariness of mind and body, our physical immune system is now lowered, so now we're more susceptible to viruses and to illness, so we might be end up being sick, not because we're sin, we end up being sick because we are, first of all, weary in our minds and weary in our bodies. That took a toll on our physical body. Now we're suffering from some physical malady that's a result of a weariness of mind and weariness of body. Are you following me? That's what James was talking about. 
When he says in verse 14, is any among you sick? Are you weak and are you feeble? Let me, understand, let me help you understand why you're weak and feeble. You're weak and feeble because you're sick because of physical exhaustion and weariness of mind. So then what is the cure for that, he says? If any among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So if I'm spiritually tired, I'm spiritually exhausted, my get up and go has gotten up and gone, and I can't seem to get it together, then I call for the elders of the church because I need a spiritual remedy for the spiritual malady that I have. And the elders of the church, they come and they anoint me with oil. Another interesting play on words. James did not use the word creo, which refers to the ceremonial anointing, the anointing of the prophets, the anointing of the kings. No, he said, let them bring the oil and let them rub it in your body, you see. Because oil was used not only for ceremonial purposes, but also for medical, medicinal purposes. And so he said, let the elders come and let them anoint you with oil and let them rub the oil in your body because what you need is to have your spirit lifted. You need to have the spirit lifted, and so you need the anointing of the elders, those spiritual men and women, to come and to lay their hands on you, and in laying their hands on you, and they're praying to God, you hear these spiritual people interceding to God on your behalf, you realize you are valued by the spiritual leaders of the church as they lift you before the living God, and so now you're lifted in your spirit because those who've given spiritual charge over you are discharging their responsibility before God to bear you before the living God. So James says, if you are sick because you're weary in your mind, which resulted in a fatigue in your body, which may have resulted in some physical sin, call the elders of the church. But if you got cancer, call the doctor. <laughs> if you got a bad heart, go to the emergency room and let the elders meet you there. I want you to understand what he's saying. James is not saying that prayer is going to be a cure-all for every physical illness that someone has. The context here is a spiritual situation, spiritual fatigue, weariness of mind, weariness of body. He was not suggesting, because if he was suggesting that, then we would say, James, you told us something wasn't true. Because many times we prayed over people that were sick, and they did not get better. As a matter of fact, they died or their physical condition may have worsened, or it may be a chronic situation that for whatever reason in God's sovereign omniscient design, he's chosen to map into our DNA, our genetic makeup, that there's gonna be some disease that's gonna manifest itself at some time in our lives, and we're gonna live with that. And so we pray for God's strength and we pray for God's grace, and God may not remove that physical thorn in the flesh, and so if we got high blood pressure, take the medication. You got high cholesterol, get you some Crestor, get you some Lipitor. If you got diabetes, take your insulin. Don't be sick and don't have your body in a worse situation because you got people praying for you over you and you don't get better physically. Use everything that's at your disposal that is legitimate. And that's why Paul told to Timothy. Timothy who had a tendency to suffer from anxiety, maybe even depression, and Paul said, son, drink a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake. He may have had an awful. He may have had some stomach situation. So Paul says, not don't drink wine and get drunk, but you drink it for a, as a medicinal remedy for the physical situation that you have. And this is the man who had laid hands on people and healed folk. But Paul recognized, if you look at Paul's ministry, you see that toward the end of his ministry, the supernatural, miraculous, divine healing that we saw in the beginning of his ministry starts to move and start to disappear. Can God heal miraculously? Absolutely. Does God heal miraculously? Absolutely. Will God heal miraculously every time? Absolutely not. Are people going to be sick? Absolutely. Are they going to be sick with chronic illnesses? Absolutely. Are Christians going to die from some horrible illnesses? Absolutely. Happens every single day. And you can drown them in a bucket of oil. And you can pray with them into your hearts. But God is not obligated to heal every physical situation. But God does bind himself and he obligates himself. He will always show up when there's prayers offered in faith. 
And he will always bring ministry. He will always bring encouragement. So James' exhortation to us is that if we are afflicted, then we pray. If we are cheerful, then we praise. If we are sick, then we petition for the spiritual elders to come and to pray over us and to pray a prayer of faith. Verse 15, I'm going to wrap up in just about seven minutes. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now we know that James is not giving a blank prescription saying that every time we pray for somebody that is sick, they're going to be saved from death. We know that that simply does not happen. If that's the case, that they would all still be living. The apostles would still be living and they'd be close to 2,000 years of age. There's one thing that's sure, we're going to all die. If Jesus Christ does not return in our lifetime, we're going to die, and most of us will die from some physical malady, some disease that was coded into our DNA when we were conceived in our mother's womb. And for some of us, don't care what we eat, don't care how much we exercise, don't care how much we watch the diet, don't care how frequently we go to the doctor, and we're going to do all of those things. But there's some things coded into our physical DNA that at the time it's going to kick in and we're going to suffer with that physical condition and that's just the way of things. And that's just the way of things. And James was not trying to offer some simplistic solution to that. No, he was offering practical advice to the tired, to the weary, to the fatigued. And I think what he was suggesting is if you don't get spiritual help, then you can backslide into a spiritual situation where you do sin because fatigue and weariness has a way of wearing on us. And not only is our physical immune system worn down, but we're tired and we're weary and we're fatigued and discouraged, our spiritual immune system can be worn down as well and we're susceptible to sin. And that's why James says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and as he hath committed sins, he will be forgiven. The exhortation, if you are afflicted or suffering, pray. If you are merry or cheerful, then praise. If you are sick in terms of spiritual discouragement, then petition the elders to come and to pray over you. And look at verse 16. He says, confess your trespasses, to one another and pray for one another. Now, this is interesting. The King James says, confess your faults. Not a good translation. The better translation is trespass because James, specifically led by the Holy Spirit, he selects the specific word to convey the meaning, paraptoma. There are many words in the Greek text to describe sin, you see. There's one that describes sins that we missed the mark. An arrow, shooting at a target, we missed the mark. The another one that says that we're just lawless. There are about five or six Greek words, but one is the word trespass. Now, if you remember in the disciples' prayer, in one of the gospel presentations, the word forgive us our what? Trespasses. As we forgive those that trespass against us. And so the Holy Spirit is conveying a specific, a very tight meaning here. And what is a trespass? A trespass is a violation. It is a stepping over the line. It may not necessarily be blatantly stepping over the line. It may have been an accidental stepping over the line. If someone has a sign in their yard, and that sign says no trespassing, and just simply because you weren't paying attention, you didn't read the sign, you step over to the yard, guess what? You just broke the law. You just trespassed. The fact that you didn't recognize the sign is irrelevant. The boundaries were clearly drawn. That was their personal property, and they had the right to say, you can't walk on my property. And so in, this, in our Christian lives, there are times when we trespass. The same word that Paul used in Galatians chapter 6 when he says, Brethren, if one be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, lest ye also be tempted. Overtaking a fault, the King James says, could have been trespassed. Better translation. If someone just kind of steps over the line, the boundaries that God has drawn, then they need to be restored. So what James says, one of the ways that we bring about healing within the body of Christ is that when we recognize ourselves that we've trespassed. 
then we confess our trespass to some other brother or sister. And the violation may have not been directly against them. It's just that we are confessing. Hamalageo, we're saying the same thing. We're agreeing with God. We're agreeing with God that we have trespassed, that we have stepped over the line. And as we agree with God, as we share with our other brothers and sisters in Christ, then we can pray for each other. We then pray for one another. And that's a very strong word that James uses for prayer. The word that James uses for prayer is curse the idea of intense worship. So James says, do you worship God in your praying? Because prayer is not just some cavalier approach of God. Prayer is when the Christian has the audacity to believe that they can exalt the throne room of God, go into God's presence and bring petitions and intercessions and requests. And James says you want to do it in a prayerful attitude and in a prayerful disposition and in a worshipful attitude because you're in the presence of a holy God. In the presence of a holy God. We talked about that a little bit on yesterday morning. Brother Ed Hill gave a brilliant presentation on this whole idea of worship. And what is this all about? You know what worship is all about? Worship is all about getting an audience with God. Worship is all about having an encounter with the living God. Worship is all about believing that me, a mere mortal human being with frail, fragile feet and flawed lips, I can go in the presence of God and not be killed. Worship believes that God wants us to be there. And worship is our response to what God is doing apart from us. God is doing something totally apart from us. The whole creation was done totally apart from us. We were not here. So worship is how do I respond to what God is doing apart from me? How do I respond to what God is doing in and through me? How do I respond to what God has done for me? And that's what worship is. And I share it with the men, not to be some type of spiritual giant because I'm probably the least spiritual person here. But I share it with the men there are times in my own personal life I will encounter a situation and my heart will literally flutter in my chest because I know I'm in the presence of a holy God. And I had such an encounter this past week. A good friend of my mother's, Melvin Knight, the champ, the wild boy in our community, man who have never had any interest in spiritual things, never had interest in going into church, to my personal knowledge, he's a close friend of my mother's. And after my oldest brother got killed when I was nine years old, he became a close friend of mine because very few young people my age want to sit down and watch sporting events and discuss it and analyze it and dissect it and try to understand it. So on Sunday afternoons, when he was recovering from his weekend drunk, that was a root weekend ritual, that he would get drunk every week on Friday. He would take most of his money home to Marie. He would keep a little bit for himself and him in Hollywood and Chevrolet and my own mama would pull their monies together and they would buy Gibson Toke wine, the wine with the pheasant bird on it. And they would drink all weekend long and be just running, staggering drunk. But Melvin Knight knew that on Monday morning, I got to be at the school, Mount Hope High School, as the janitor. So he started getting himself together on Sunday, and we would sit there, and he would drink coffee, and we'd watch the Baltimore Coast and the Cleveland Browns, and God knitted my heart with, together with this drunk. And when he started getting sick, like when I saw him almost 15 years ago, he said, Matty boy, you got to preach my funeral. And he would tell my stepmother, my stepmother, he had real good friends, they talked every single day. I called them the Mount Hope Register, the Turkey Knob Tribune. Melvin Knight, 80 some years old, on dialysis, can't leave the house. My stepmother, 80 some year old, years old, never had a driver's license, drove all over the Mount Hope Western, never had a driver's license. Now she got a little bit older, her nerves have gotten bad, she can't drive, can't leave the house, he can't leave the house. They know everything that's going on, in the t everything. My sister can testify. I go up and just sit in the chair and I just like push the button like on the tape play and let her talk. Everything going, this is what Melvin told me. Melvin told me this and we found out that every, they know everything that's going on. But I went to see the champ. He called. I asked my sister Rose called and said, the champ is in the hospital. He's not going to make it. And he keeps talking about, are you going to preach this funeral? Are you going to preach this funeral? This happened Friday. And I called my older sister, Linda, and her husband, Ollie, who's here. I said, look, we need to go up to see the champ. We got to go to see the bull. And so we jumped in the car. We drove, drove to Beckley up to the Raleigh Regional General Hospital and went up to the room. And there he is, just a shell of the man that I knew. 
No longer the wild bull with muscles ripping through his forearms and in his biceps. Almost in a drawn up position, probably less than 80 pounds. Tubes running from all over the place. But he looked at me and he looked at my sister. And he kept looking. Eyesight is gone because of kidney failure and diabetes. And I said, champ, you know who I am? He said, oh, yeah, Matty boy. And I said, you know who this is? And he looked at my sister, and she said, I'm brains. That's what we used to call my sister, brains, because she's always reading all these books, and she knew all this stuff that none of the rest of us knew. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's brains. And the champ looked at me, and as I closed, and the champ said, Matty boy, are you ready to preach that? I said, no, champ. I'm not ready to preach it. I'm not ready to preach it because I don't think you're ready to meet God. And I said, champ, where do you stand with the Lord? And the champ said, I don't know. And I don't want to talk about it. I said, champ, we got to talk about it. Because I can't preach this funeral until I know where you stand with the Lord. And I said, champ, you remember when we used to watch those ball games? And sometime it looked like that one team was going to win. They would lead the whole game. But then at the end of the game, the other team, some kind of way miraculously would come through with the play, and they would snatch the victory out. I said, that's the way it is in life. How we live really does matter, but how we end up matters much more. And I say, champ, God knows all the wine you done drunk, all the fighting you done did, all the cussing you've done, God knows all about it. But here, right now, it's at the end of the game. And God is here, and I believe he sent me up here to tell you that he still loves you, that Jesus Christ died for you, and he wants to save you and to forgive your sins. I say, champ, don't you want to go to heaven? In a barely audible voice, the champ said, yeah, I want to go. I want to go. And right there land on the blade, and my heart started to flood in my chest because I knew that God was in that room. Every time I had attempted before to talk to him about Jesus Christ, he didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to, as close as we were, he didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to talk about it. But God bringing him to that point and to that place, and I've been praying for him. Lord, you got to save the champ. You got to save the champ. And the Lord opened his heart and he prayed and received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. That's what I'm talking about, y'all. I'm talking about when we worship God, we're in God's presence. And we want God to show up to be with us when we need for him to be there. And that's why Jesus says that God is seeking true worshipers that will worship in the spirit and in truth. Because we're always in God's spiritual presence. And because we're always in God's spiritual presence, we should be in a worshipful posture, in a worshipful attitude. Because we want God to show up. And we sometimes don't have time for the praise team to come and sing it up. And we don't have time to beat it up and to generate it up. And we always got to be a worshiping people. So that when we need God, we're in his presence, and then we turn it over to him to show up and do something only he can do. Well, let me wrap this thing up. I could go on, but I'm not. James goes on to say, confess your trespass to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then his exhortation to us is that if you're afflicted, then you ought to pray. If your soul is married, then you ought to praise God. If you're sick, you petition for the elders to come and to pray for you. And if you've sinned, then you confess to your brothers and sisters in Christ so that you can be healed. Then James gives us an example. An example. He says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he says, Elijah. And I like what the New King James Hyde phrases this. It's more accurate to the Greek text. He says, Elijah was a man. You got to stop right there. Elijah was a man. So James is emphasizing the fact that he was a man, not some superhuman spiritual being. Elijah was just a man. A man with the feet of clay. A man with unclean lips. Elijah was just a man. And then he goes on to say, with a nature like ours. The King James says a man of like passions, but the new King James gets it more accurate. Well, a sinful nature just like ours. So he brings Elijah off this high and lofty pedestal and bring him down in the murk and the mire with us, a man with a nature just like ours. He said, but Elijah believed in prayer. 
And when wicked Ahab and Jezebel was wreaking havoc in the land and Elijah was trying to get their attention, they didn't want to hear nothing he had to say. And he was one of the most, the most revered prophet of the Old Testament and the most powerful preacher. But they didn't want to hear nothing Elijah had to say. And so Elijah stiled away and he said, Lord, I can't get their attention, but you can. And then Elijah, this man of like passion with a sinful nature, petitioned God, and James says God heard him. And God said, Elijah, you might not be able to get their attention, but I can. And God calls brass to cover up the heavens. And it did not rain for a space of three and a half years because God was responding to the petition and the prayer of a man who just wanted God to be heard. And then he said he prayed again and the heavens opened up and the rains came. So he said, if you need an example, just look to old ragtag Elijah. A man of like passion, of like nature, just like us. But he believed that a little talk with Jesus would make it right. He believed that prayer afforded him the venue to get God's attention. And if you don't remember nothing else I've said, prayer is the way that you get God's attention. And if you, get, if you got God's attention, that, that's all you need is to have God's attention. My little grandson, he gets everybody's attention. He knows how to get your attention, and he's going to make you pay attention to what he's doing. And he's going to make you respond to his needs. Every time I have him, we'd be going somewhere, and he'll say, Paul, Paul, I'm very, very hungry, he would say. For real. <laughs> I'm very, very hungry for real. And when he put that for real on there, he's getting my attention. I'm not just saying this because we just passed witness. This is for real. <laughs> and when the for real comes on in, that means we got to stop at the next food stand. Let's just going to get very unpleasant in the car. When we go into the presence of the Lord, we say, God, I, I, I really need you now. For real. I need your attention for real. And we go in God's presence and we are for real, then God will show up and He will hear our prayer and our request and our petition for real. Let's bow together, shall we? Father, we are so grateful that you've given us access to you. And we don't need a 911 number, 1 800 number, we don't need a cell phone. Whenever and wherever we are, we need your attention. We need to be in your presence, Father. We can pray. And we thank you for it, Lord. And that prayer is always the order of the day. I pray for your people here this morning, some who are afflicted. Let them pray. Some who are cheerful or merciful, let them praise you. Some who are sick, let them petition the elders of the church to come and pray for them. The prayer of faith might bring encouragement to them. They might be lifted up from the spiritual doldrums. Father, there are others of us who need to confess our faults to each other so that you can bring spiritual healing, healing to us. And we thank you for that, Lord. Meet the needs of your people today and manifest yourself so they will know that you are indeed real. And you were for real when you promised to hear the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous. If there's one in our midst who's never put their faith in the living Christ, Father, let them know today that you were for real when you said that whoever comes to me, I will no wise cast out. That you were for real when you gave your life on the cross of Calvary. You took the punishment for our sins. You raised from the dead on the third day. And you are for real when you say, whosoever will, let him come, let her come. Drink of the water of life freely. Move in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's one here this morning, you've never come to faith in the living Christ. Today is the day that God has orchestrated. This moment, this hour for you to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you. Jesus Christ is concerned about you. And he died on the cross for you. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I cannot save myself, but I believe that you love me, that you died for me, 
that you raised from the dead. I put all my hope, all my faith in you, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and save me. If you say, pray that simple prayer, just raise your hand where you are. Is there one? Maybe you already say that you need to recommit your life to the Lord on this first day, first Sunday of May. Why don't you do that? If you're looking for a church home, it be our greatest joy to have you to come to unite with us. We might be the least of God's people in this city, but we are for real in our desire to serve the living Christ. The doors of the church are open, the invitation is extended. Whosoever will, let him come, let her come. And have an audience with the living God that he might bring healing to your afflicted soul, your troubled mind, your broken spirit, even your ailing body. Whosoever will, let him come. like prayer, you can come. Or if you'd like to come and to pray for someone else, you can come. The altar is a mysterious place. It's a marvelous place. This throne of grace where we meet and we encounter the living God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for those who have been led by your Holy Spirit to come to the altar this morning. And Father, you know what has burdened their hearts and their minds, and you know what may be afflicting them, what may be troubling them. You, may, you know what may be causing them to have anxious moments. And our prayer, Lord God, is that you would just meet with them right here at this altar, that you would give them an audience, and they would sense your care and your concern for them. And we're believing you, Father, that you're going to move in a mighty way, a majestic way, a supernatural way. And if they will know that it was a direct result of them coming to the altar and laying their burden down at your feet. For your word instructs us we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can find mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And your word instructs us, Lord God, we can cast all, not some, but all of our cares upon you because you care for us. And that encourages us to know that we are cared for and that we are comforted and we are encouraged by this living Christ who was raised from the dead, who's touched with all the feeling of our infirmity. And we know there's one at your right hand, Father, who knows all that we're going through, who, have, who has endured it all. And he never yielded or sinned or succumbed, Lord. So he can be a faithful high priest on our behalf, making intercessions for us and making sure that heaven is always aware of what is going on in our respective lives. As insignificant as they might appear to some, but in your, life, in your sight there's no insignificant lives, there are no insignificant children in your family. We each have your attention and we thank you, Lord to bless these that have come and give them great encouragement today. And may this day be filled with joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. At this time, we're going to observe the Lord's table. And if you're here this morning, we observe open communion here. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then we welcome you to join us as we observe the Lord's table. And for the sake of efficiency and time, if you could sort of move down closer to the front, and uh, we can serve you more expeditiously. And also while you're coming, if you could prepare your offering as we will observe the Lord's table and then worship the Lord with our gifts, with our tithes, and with our offerings. Amen. The scriptures teach us that on the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed to be crucified, 
that he met with his disciples. 